Uh, join me in Ezekiel, something you haven't heard in this place in probably quite a while or maybe even ever. Um, Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2. If you um, are using the Pew Bible, it's on page 693. 693. Um, if you don't know where Ezekiel's at, there's a table of contents in the beginning of your Bible that'll help you find it. It's in the Old Testament. Um, pretty much if you probably open your Bible to the middle and go a little bit to the left, you might be finding it, but it's around there. Sometimes life can feel empty and dry and full of voids. We looked at Psalm 63 a couple weeks ago, which starts out with this line. O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you in a dry and thirsty land with no water. It doesn't say the land might be dry and thirsty. It's saying this is how it is. And that line, in a dry and thirsty land with no water, that, can just, that describes how life can feel sometimes. Maybe at work you feel like you're just going through the motions. Maybe your relationship has had more bumps in the road than high points recently. Maybe there's nothing on the calendar coming up that you're really looking forward to. Maybe the idea of a new semester of homework is just not an exciting thing. Most importantly, maybe things spiritually seem a little off or that God seems distant. And then the last couple months, add that onto any of these things where Many of the things we were looking forward to in the holiday season only had to be derailed because of the Omicron variant, and all of those things get worse. We want life to be alive and thriving, but interruptions and difficulties and unknowns, it's no wonder it can feel dry and thirsty sometimes. Take that idea to Psalm 107. Psalm 107 says, verses 4 and 5, Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. What kind of an existence is that? I mean, the, listen to that description. Some people... They, in their lives, they wandered in desert wastelands. They found no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty. And the tragedy of this last phrase, and their lives ebbed away. What kind of an existence is that? Wandering aimlessly, finding no way, life ebbing away. The reality is, is that there's a danger that when we are in a dry and thirsty season of life, if we are not seeking after God, then we will begin aimlessly wandering through life. Ask yourself, do you want your life to be like that? Do you want your life to be described like that passage? feeling like you're just wandering through, like you can't find your way, or you're feeling like you don't have a place to be. I know I don't want my life to be like that, and I don't want your life to be like that. Not one of just ebbing away, God help us know. And so as we start the year with not only 21 days of prayer and fasting, we're also starting with this series, short series called Come Alive, based out of this Old Testament prophetic book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet during one of Israel's lowest points. The book is long, and to be honest, it is one of the harder books in the Old Testament to get through and to get our minds around. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have an important, relevant message for us today. And so we're going to be looking at a couple of specific portions of this book to spur us on to come alive to not be aimlessly wandering, but to be able to thrive even when life feels dry and dusty. Really, I can't think of a better or more important theme to start the year on, especially with everything going on than this. And so in that, let's pray together and ask God to speak to our hearts as we open up this book.
God, we do. We thank you so much for your presence. We thank you, Spirit, that you're here. Whether we're sitting in the pews or we're sitting at home, you, you're, you're with us. You're speaking to us. You care for us. We, you love us, and we are so grateful. And God, you know what we're experiencing. You know everything that we're going through, the challenges, the concerns, the confusion, the hopes, the excitement, whatever it may be, God. And so we pray that from you, your awareness of us, that you would make us aware of you. That you would make us aware of your love for us, the truths that you want to speak to us, the things you want us to understand about you and about ourselves. God, I pray you would speak to us and give us ears to hear. Remove the distractions, remove the things that are in our way, and help us to hear from you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You know what, before I jump into this, I meant to say this before I prayed too. Uh, not all of you knew, but some of you knew. Uh, Friday, our family found out that my grandmother had fallen down the stairs and broke her hip. Um, my mom had tried calling her, and she wasn't answering, and they went over and checked on her, and they couldn't get in. Uh, she wasn't answering, so they got in, and they found her, took her to the hospital. Um, she had surgery this morning at 7.30 to repair it, and 89-year-old having hip surgery, I, I was worried. And uh, we actually found out like 15 minutes ago that the surgery went great and that she's, gonna, she's doing well and they're going to see her later today. So, so that's, yeah, so <laughs> praise God for that. I know some of you are praying, so I just wanted you to know uh, because for me it's like, whew, here we go. <laughs> but I will say I'm very grateful, especially thinking about what this passage is about today. All of us FaceTimed my grandmother last night and the last thing she said to me before uh, we got off the phone was she said, well, Bobby, you keep preaching the word and bringing souls to Jesus. You know, and I thought, man, if that's the last thing I hear my grandmother say, what a last charge. And so not a bad thing to take into your Sunday sermon, right? We're going to start off with chapter two today in Ezekiel. Most of chapter two sets the stage for the prophecies throughout the book of Ezekiel. But as I read this section, we're going to read a good chunk of this, I want you to be listening for something. As I read this, and I mean look in your Bible and follow along, I want you, or on the screens, I want you to listen for how God describes the people that Ezekiel is going to go and speak to. So how are the people referred, as, referred to as? And so Ezekiel chapter 2. God said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet, and I will speak to you. And he spoke. The Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me, they and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are, re are a rebellious people, they will know what a, that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or be terrified of them, though they are a rebellious people. You must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. I mean, you, you heard the repeated phrase, right? I mean, over and over in this paragraph. How are they described? As a rebellious people. Rebellious. What is Ezekiel talking about when he describes them as a rebellious people? Well, scholar Daniel Block, he defines this idea of rebellion as to rise up in revolt against an overlord, to refuse allegiance to one's sovereign. And this is specific language in their time and what's going on here in Ezekiel's getting across because this is about their covenant with God. This is about the covenant relationship that they have with the Lord. He is their God and they are his people. 
There is not only a commitment in this, but there is also a relationship lifestyle that goes along with it. And they are going against the covenant. They are living in a way that ignores and rejects the covenant that they are in with God. And the truth is, rebellions against God create destruction. Rebellions against God create brokenness. The images Ezekiel gives to ancient Israel are like an um, apocalyptic wasteland, but one of their own creation. They have done this. They have produced this wasteland. We typically think of huge rebellions, but sometimes they're small ones. Think about a married couple who has made a covenant with each other. Adultery is a huge rebellion against that covenant that can destroy the relationship. But being selfish rather than loving, holding a grudge rather than forgiving, belittling rather than affirming, these are all tiny rebellions against the covenant, the way that the covenant life is supposed to be, and they cause cracks in the relationship. They damage the relationship. Our dry and wandering seasons with God could be caused because of our own rebellions, big or small. Maybe we've made some bad decisions. Maybe we haven't been true to the Lord. Maybe we're making small compromises, or maybe we just have outright rejected living for him and pursuing him. Maybe our dry season is caused because of the rebellion of others. Maybe the season you're in is created by the collateral damage of someone else's decisions. They are weighing on you. They're sucking the life out of you. Maybe that season is caused because of we live in a creation broken by rebellion. When Adam and Eve introduced sin into the world, it broke creation and it caused brokenness. However that it comes about, I can tell you it's not caused by God. He is pursuing us. He loves us. He bestows grace upon us and mercy upon us. It's important for us to identify what we are experiencing and feeling, not minimizing it, not writing it off, but being honest about it. That way we can identify both its source, but also how it's causing dryness. And we can bring that to the Lord. Whatever season you're in, we need to hear from God. And that is exactly Ezekiel's point. His entire point to these people is that they need to hear a word from God. 82 different times the Hebrew term for word comes up in Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. God is speaking to these people, talking to these people, trying to get their attention. Even as they turn the other way, even as they want to give up, even as they choose the lost wandering rather than following him, God doesn't stop speaking to them. It says, in fact, at the end of chapter 1, Ezekiel put it this way, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell face down and I heard the voice of the one speaking. If you could summarize all of Ezekiel in one line, it's that. Hear the voice of the one speaking to you. And we need to hear from him as well. This book is about hearing the word of the Lord. How, we, how do we come alive in the dry and wondering seasons? By hearing the word of the Lord. By hearing from him. And we're going to see Ezekiel unpack that in these first couple chapters. The first thing we need to see is this, is come alive by being attuned to the word of God. Come alive by being attuned to the word of God. It says in Ezekiel 2, verse 8, But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious people. You be different. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Then I looked and I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll 
which he had unrolled before me. On both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. God says, listen to me. Listen to me. Have you ever had anybody do that? I mean, I do that almost any Sunday. We do the two-minute mingle. You're all talking, and I'm like, hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Sometimes you got to go like this, but it's, hey, listen to me. And that's what God is telling them. With everything going on, with all the crosstalk, with all the life chaos, with all the busyness, listen. Listen to me, God says. Don't ignore me like this rebellious people. Rebellious people, hear me. And he mentions offering Ezekiel a scroll. It is a word being given directly from the Lord. He is handing it to Ezekiel. Its source is true and trustworthy. It's written completely on the front and completely on the back. The whole page is full. This is not a blank check to do whatever one wants with. It is a full and complete message. Its content is summarized with three words that summarize the prophecies to come. Lament, literally a funeral dirge song. Mourning, words of sorrow. And woes, pronouncements of doom. These three terms, again, summarize the message that Ezekiel is going to bring to these people within this particular book. And why is it such a downer message? Because this is the situation that these people find themselves in. They are rebelling against the Lord, and so the Lord is speaking directly to them about the situation that they're in. As we'll see in the next couple weeks, this isn't the only message. He's also going to bring them opportunity, gives them hope, opportunity to be restored, to change their ways. But they must see the reality of their rebellion also. They need to hear God speak, to speak about their lives and where they are. The Lord doesn't hand you and I a scroll but we are able to hold his word. Whether you have your Bible in your hand, whether it's an app on your phone or you're reading it on your computer, you are able to hold the word of God. I heard somebody say one time, if you want to hear the voice of God, read your Bible out loud. Because when we read the Bible, we are reading the words of God. All of the word is similar to Ezekiel. Not necessarily in tone. Ezekiel is very unique in how strong its language is. But in purpose, the Bible is the same throughout, that we would hear from God. And the call to us is the same. God says to us, listen to what I say to you. Hebrews explains it perfectly. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, to expose our innermost thoughts and desires. For Ezekiel, this message is so strong, laments and sorrows and woes, because that's what the sword needed to cut down into. Other parts of it, the cut might be about encouragement. It might be, excuse me, reminding you of your identity. It might be showing you the way that you need to walk. Other times it might be, this isn't supposed to be here. But the word of God will penetrate all the excuses, all the surface talk, all of the going through the motions to the reality of who we are. We can't be like the rebellious, ignoring God, listening to other voices, rejecting his voice. He is calling out to you and to me, and they, they, to them, he keeps calling them, he keeps speaking to rebellious, and they keep trying to send God to voicemail. Have you had that happen where somebody calls and you don't know the number, or maybe you do, and you kind of up and you kind of hit it and it just sends it to voicemail? They're trying to do that with God. That is not how it works. And the reality, there's times when we've done that as well. We can always point to somebody else's bigger rebellions to mask our smaller ones but rebellions before god are rebellions before god and how often do we hit the voicemail button with somebody that can't be sent there god is speaking to you 
God is calling out to you in his word. Listen to him. We listen to the word, but it's not meant to be merely an auditory experience. The second thing about it is that we come alive by consuming the word of God. By consuming the word. Going into chapter 3, verse 1. And God said, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll, then go and speak to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat the scroll I am giving you, and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. We've all been in that situation where a plate was put before somebody, and they didn't eat it, or they only ate a couple bites of it. A lot of work goes into it. You pay money for a nice meal at a restaurant or whatever. You put the meal before somebody, and they only eat a couple of it, a bites of it. And it's like, come on. <laughs> and the waste, and the you were hungry, and what's going on? No, I'm good. I don't want any. It happens with kids all the time. Three bites in, and they're done. Why? Distracted by something else. Don't like how it tastes want to go and do their own thing rather than eat the meal, just want to eat candy or chips rather than a healthy dinner. Not that I'm pulling these examples from your life or anything, just maybe this is what happens. But the reality is, don't those childlike excuses sound like the same reasons we don't want to consume the word of God? Don't like how it tastes. Distracted by something else want to go and do our own thing, just want to eat unhealthy things and hear unhealthy things rather than consuming the word. God is saying, I'm putting this before you. You need to eat it, and you need to eat all of it. Don't eat just part of it. Consume all of it. Fill your stomach with it. And we're not merely meant to hear the words of God. We are meant to consume them that they would fill us. Eat that scroll. Eat that word. Consume it. To consume means to take it in and to implement it. God told Ezekiel, eat the word and then go speak to the people. Fill fill yourself with the word so that you can then give the word. In the same way, we are to take the word within us, to fill ourselves with the word, and then what the word is saying should come out of us. We should be acting upon it, implementing it, allowing it to guide us and direct our lives. In the New Testament, it's put very specifically. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Not from a moralistic, just do this and you'll be okay, but because this is what life in this relationship looks like. Here's how you live this relationship. And we do have responsibilities within that. There is a way that that looks. We take the word in, and then we live it out. The word, though, oh God, the word of God, though, is not simply a list of rules to ruin our fun or dampen the heart of your life. Listen to what Psalm 19 says about the word of God. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey. Even honey dripping from the comb, they are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. Did you hear those descriptions? What the word of God does revives our souls, makes us wise, brings us joy, gives us insight. They are true. They last forever. They are fair. The question is not, do you want to eat the word of God? The question is, why would you not want to eat the word of God with what it is promising to do in our lives? 
It says in Psalm 119, ask yourself as I read this, listen to how he talks about the word of God. And ask yourself, is this how, could I say this about the word of God? Could these be my words? Oh, how I love your instructions. I think about them all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are my constant guide. Yes, I have more insight than my teachers, for I am always thinking of your laws. I am even wiser than my elders, for I have kept your commandments. I have refused to walk on any evil path, so that I might gain obedient, may, may remain obedient to your word. I haven't turned away from your regulations, for you have taught me well. How sweet your words taste to me. They are sweeter than honey. Your commandments give me understanding. No wonder I hate every false way of life. Is that how you think about the word of God? That's how we should be. That should be our disposition toward the word. It is not boring. It is not dull. It is not dry. It is full of life meant to give us life. And if you are reading it in a way and it's like, this is just boring, it doesn't make sense, then that means we need to learn how to read it and read it well. And that's okay. That's a great thing to admit. That's what we should admit. But because we haven't been trained or discipled to read the word doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the word. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with us. We just have a skill that we need to learn. And so in that, what does eating the word look like, practically look like in day-to-day -day life? Well, first off, it's something that should happen daily, not occasionally. Do you, just like you can't go with one meal a week or one meal a month, we must be in the word regularly. It doesn't mean you have to read all of Ezekiel every day or that much, but even a paragraph, even a short amount and to be able to feed on that and meditate on that and allow God to encourage your heart through it. It should be understood, not merely reading. We're not just checking off a box. We're not trying to just do a mindless activity. Oh, okay, I did that thing. I've, I marked the, the action. To eat the word is to try to grasp what it's saying. What is God communicating here? To comprehend its message, to ponder its implications. What is, the, what is this trying to do in the, my life? What is God doing with this? What does he want to see in me, in the church? So understanding it, not just trying to know it, not just reading it. And then last, implementing, not simply knowing. To not, it isn't just, well, I, yeah, I, I read it and I get it. But then stopping there, but I've read it, I get it, and then now I'm going to act on what it wants me to do. I'm implementing what the word says. Eugene Peterson says this, the text insists on participation. Live what you read. We read the Bible in order to live the word of God. You know, sometimes... You know, uh, both of my kids are downstairs, so I'll use this illustration. Um, sometimes we'll want to go and do something in the city, and Jeanette and I will be like, hey, let's go do this, let's go do this. And the kids are like, oh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to, I'm a teenager. And they don't want to go. And we're like, well, no, you're going with the, oh, then she came in to see what I'm saying. Um, and then we'll say <laughs> that, no, you're going to go along with us. And they go. And once we get going, and once they do it, then it's like, oh, yeah, that was fun. I mean, they're not going to admit it later. But in the moment, you know that they think it's fun. The reality is, is that that's a lot of times what happens with us. We hear the word, the word is put before us. Well, I don't want to do it. I mean, I don't want to participate in that. I mean, I hear it. I hear, see what you're saying. It's put before me. The opportunity is there, but I don't want to do it. And we get all teenager on the word of God. The reality is God is saying, no, no, no. The point is to do this. The point is to be a part of this. The point is to participate in this. The point is to join God in what he's doing and to be his people as he's told us. We have to implement and not simply know. And that takes work. And you know what? It's okay to say that. The Bible is not a fast food experience where you drive up to the scripture, ask your question, get your answer, and then go on. And I guarantee if that's how people are doing it, they're getting the wrong answers because they're probably not getting what the Bible is saying. They're getting whatever they want to come up with based on the words. 
I guarantee they're not hearing from the Lord all the time in that. They're probably hearing from themselves and then saying it's from the Lord. Because it takes work. It does take work. Don't think about a fast food thing. Think about preparing a Thanksgiving meal. It takes time, effort, desire, and expectation. And because of that, it's better, it's healthier, and it's completely worth it. And so some ways that you can get started or even go to the next level as far as consuming the Word of God. Well, first thing I already mentioned is that you should get the 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting resource that we have on our communication page. Because every day there, it's here's the Word, but it's not just read it and check a box. It, there's direction on there on how to read the Word, things to look for, to prayerfully read it. And so if you've never done anything else, just get that and follow along. If you're just starting it today, then start with day one. You don't have to skip the first week. And allow that to get you going to where you can take what you learn in those 21 days to other parts of Scripture and keep reading from there. And so that 21 days resource is helpful. There's different apps, if you have a smartphone, that you can download that can be really helpful. Uversion is one. There's a ton of different reading plans and different things in there. There's also an app called Lectio 365, which is a, um, walks you through the prayer discipline of Lectino Divina. Uh, we're not going to get into that right now, but if you download the app, it's how to prayerfully read the Word of God. And either one of those apps would be really helpful to you. Third way is in community. This is what we try to do in our community groups, to open up the Word together, to talk through it. What is this trying to communicate? What is God doing with this Word? What does this mean for us? And so we have current community groups. We're trying to get some more formulated and launched by the end of this month. And so be looking for those. But this is a time where if you're not in a group, to get into a group. So be praying about that. And just to say, if you've been here for a while, we definitely need some group help. And so if that's something you're interested in, please let me know that as well. Um, two other things. One is to pick up the book Living by the Book by Howard Hendricks. Um, this is a book that is about how to study the Bible. Uh, it's actually a book I use with students at Moody. It's like the most classic first how to study the Bible type book. And if you've never uh, read that, I would highly recommend it. Um, and we'll post all of these um, and email them out as well. And then last thing I would say is, and this isn't like about me, this is, the re this is how you do it. Take notes during service. You should not be passively participating in a message. You should be actively participating in a message. And one of the ways you do that is to write things down. Write passages down. Write insights down. How does, not just writing down the things I say or if somebody else is speaking, but what does it do in your heart? When I say, man, is there anybody you could be praying for? When somebody's name pops in, write that down. When I say, I read Psalm 119 about the Word of God, and I say, does this describe you? Which parts stick out? Write that down. Actively write down things during service. Review them later and ask yourself, how do I implement these things in my life? These are just some suggestions on how to begin consuming the Word of God. But it comes down to this. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. I guarantee you, if you are in a dry season spiritually, I'm not talking about like a couple days because, you know, that could be anything, but like a long, dry season, just it's not where it should be, not feel like I, I am where I need to be with the Lord, I would almost bet one of the questions I would ask you if we were to talk, how, how is your time within the Word of God? How has your time been consuming the Word? And I would almost bet it's been little. Not that it's, that's not an issue trying to shame anyone, and not that I'm saying if you read the Bible every day, life is going to be happy and cheerful and awesome. But if we're not in the Word of God, we are disconnected from a source of life. We are disconnected from hearing from him. And the most basic of things, if we are not connected to the one speaking to us, then the results of that are dryness and dullness. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys 
of those who consume his word. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Consume the word. Last thing quickly, come alive by being faithful to the guidance and wisdom of the word of God. It says in in verse 4, God then said to me, Son of man, go now to the people of Israel and speak my words to them. You are not being sent to a people of obscure speech and strange language, but to the people of Israel. Not to many peoples of obscure speech and strange language whose words you can understand. Surely if I had sent you to them, they would have listened to you. But the people of Israel are not willing to listen to you because they are not willing to listen to me. For all the Israelites are hardened and obstinate. But I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are rebellious people. And he said to me, Son of man, listen carefully and take heart all the words I speak to you. Go now to your people in exile and speak to them. Say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, whether they listen or fail to listen. God telling Ezekiel that he isn't going to a foreign people who are unaware of who God is and his ways, he's saying, Ezekiel, you're going to God's chosen people, his covenant nation. The people that are going to hear from Ezekiel, they should know better. This is not new to them. These are Torah people, covenant people, word of God people, law of the Lord people. They should know better. They should know. This isn't anything new to them. They are simply not willing to listen because they have hard hearts. Because they have hard, stubborn hearts hearts. Maybe their hearts are hard because of the hardship they've experienced. Maybe because of the losses that they've had. Maybe it's hard because they don't want to acknowledge the reality of their unfaithfulness. But their hearts are hard, stubborn, unyielding. They don't want to hear from God. God tells Ezekiel not to be afraid of their actions or their words, he's going to make Ezekiel's head as hard as their hearts, meaning he's going to protect Ezekiel from their onslaught and rejection. God is calling Ezekiel to consume his word amongst people who are going to reject it, who could very well reject it. And then God gives the ultimate heart check, and here's the part we really need to hear. Look at verse 10 and 11 again. He said to me, son of man, listen carefully and take to heart all the words I speak to you. Go now to your people in exile and speak to them. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, whether they listen or fail to listen. Listen to my words, God says. Make them part of who you are. Are you going to be faithful amongst those who are not faithful. In a culture defined by rebellious, stubborn, unyielding people who want nothing to do with God, are you going to be faithful? Because God says he will protect us, he will watch over us, he will make it where we can do that. So are you going to be faithful? Even when those around you aren't being faithful. Go be faithful even in a really difficult situation? Are you going to be faithful even though you're not where you want to be? Are you going to be faithful even when those around you reject you, even when things aren't going as you want? God says, trust me, listen to me, hear me, listen to my words. And so you and I have to ask ourselves, are we listening to God? Or are we listening to somebody else? Is my heart attuned to him, consuming his word? Or am I tuning him out and only taking samples of him, if anything? 
Am I one who receives and hears or someone that's unyielding and hardened? You know, there's nothing wrong to have questions. There's nothing wrong to have doubts. There's nothing wrong to not understand. But those things don't mean that we are given permission to be unfaithful. Too often it's, well, I just don't understand this about God, or what about this, or I'm not feeling it. The source of truth in your identity is not in your misunderstanding and feelings. It's in the faithfulness and word of God. And so what are you being faithful to? Let your questions and doubts and low points and everything be opportunities to grow and know him. Those things shouldn't take us away from God. They should drive us to him. Eat the word. Do something. Don't let your questions prevent you from enjoying the thriving reality of a faithful relationship with God. Jesus said in Matthew 7, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person who builds his or her house on the rock. To have a relationship with God, to be his children, is to take his word and build our lives upon it. Are you faithfully living on the foundation of God's word? Job said at one point, I have not departed from his good commands, but have treasured his words more than daily food. And with all that Job went through, he could have easily said, I'm, forget this, I'm out of here. But in the midst of tragedy and loss, he says, I have not departed from his commands. In fact, they are more important to me than what I eat every day. This has not been an easy season. It hasn't been an easy couple years. Do not let his words depart from you. And see how important they are, even more so than food. Come alive by being faithful to the guidance and wisdom of the word of God. When we think about hearing from the word, consuming the word, being attuned to him, we're going to take this into communion right now. If you've never done communion with us, we always uh, take a moment before we receive communion to prayerfully be before the Lord for a, uh, a minute. Maybe it's confessing something to him. Maybe it's being grateful. Maybe it's just being quiet in this moment and hearing from him. If anything, that's one of the reasons why we could write things down during the message is to be able to look over those during this time and say, okay, God, what sticks out? What do you want my heart to see and be attuned to? But take this moment and hear from God. God, what part of his message that I, do I need to focus in on? What part should I really understand? What part are you trying to speak to me and care for me through? Let's take a moment of being before him and then we'll receive communion together. So God, I pray you would speak to us in the quiet of this moment. Whether we're in the building or in our homes, we know you're with us, so speak to us. Let's be quiet before him.